as always, with the exception of some discrete transformations, to construct a finite transformation, we usually start with the infinitesimal ones and integrate. Integration is here exponentiation, really. So how do I go from an infinitesimal <coughs> translation to a finite one? We think of the following. Suppose we are going to go from A to B points, and we subdivide this interval into infinitesimal intervals of equal lengths, which we indicate by dx. And let me denote this following the book, although the notation is a bit confusing, I should confess. However, as you are going to read the book in case you need. So let me then say this can be thought as composed of, if the number of subdivisions is capital N, dx. Take the magnitude of this as such, and take the unit vector in this direction to be x. Therefore, what I am now interested in is to construct this one. Notice that here, this time, this delta is a finite, is a finite one. Although, the, as I said, notation is sort of negation of the negation. It's not a good notation. I'm sticking to it. So how do I do that? We have seen that group property in relation with the vector addition operation. We can go this one through this finite interval in n steps or single step. We go this way, and then that way, and then that way, right? And each of them are of the same, this, I don't want to confuse this notation, say x is a unit vector in this direction. They are of equal length. Therefore, the operation, this translation here or there, they have the same form, independent of the location, because it is proportional to the dx, the length of the interval, times a k, independent of the location. Therefore, this entire thing, when you add it, let me rewrite the group property. I, you know, it is, the group property was, Sorry for this. It is this algebraic relation is the correct one. This is an operator, so you have, you have to act one after the other. If it is a unitary operator, it must be this type of operation, right? This is the group property. So, please. So, but that's obvious. If you go one after another in two infinitesimal steps, it, the picture I have plotted in association with this was correct. There was nothing wrong with that. dx prime first and dx next. And you could do it with a single shot in terms of these <coughs> combined infinitesimal vector. Therefore, we, in order to go from A to B, we can go from the first to the next, then second to third, etc. And as they are to be multiplied, there are n many multiplication of the same infinitesimal operator, right? <clears throat> n many means and power of the same operator. Okay. Then 
what is the usual uh, philosophy of the infinitesimal calculus? You shrink the size of the intervals to zero or you change the number of intervals to infinity. Size goes to zero, number goes to infinity. So I have to take the limit and then n going to infinity. And then in order to do this, I have to remember the definition of these delta x's. It is this dx divided by n, and there is an x unit vector of that sort. So we have to resort to a definition of the exponential operator. What is that definition? Plus or minus for any operator, you have the following definition. n goes to infinity, 1 plus minus a divided by n to the power n. That, is, that defines for you the exponential operator. That's one way of defining it. Of course, you can write it as an infinitesimal, so infinite series expansion as x to the a to the n divided by n factorial all the way. Or this also defines for you these operate, exponential operators. Mm -hmm upper sign for the upper and lower for the lower. So this then becomes e to the minus i over h bar dx x sorry again this should be replaced by the p because I wrote the h bar in here. Okay. So this is really the finite form of the translation operator. If it is, for instance, if it is in the x direction, simple Cartesian x direction, then you will have that shift in the, along the x direction. That will be the x direction translation, full translation operator then is delta x. just delta x, e to the minus i h bar delta x p x. Okay, this is the finite form of the translation operator that we have constructed. Now let's move to another subject. Well, that will enable me to construct the commutator of these k's among themselves or the p's as we have defined the k's as momentum operator normalized by the h bar. So for this p algebra for this we will follow the following argument. Suppose we start with a point A and suppose our reference frame here is x, y, and z in reference to this one. We start from a point A, go to B in the x direction, and then go to C in the y direction. That's obviously one way of translating in two steps from A to C. Well, obviously there is another pathway that you could first go from A to B prime in the Y direction and then go from B prime to C in the X direction. These are finite transformations, therefore, it enables me to write the following. As operator orderings are really opposite to the, the pathways, so you, I write T, the, T delta Y, Y, T, delta x, x, this is delta x, 
that's delta y, that's delta y in length, and that's delta x. This refers to going through this first, and then the similar expression is t delta x x t delta y y. Okay. You follow. You can follow, right? This is written there because you act on a state. The first factor is the one which act the final one, and this one refers to the upper a, a b prime c and a b c pathway. Why do we say it is the same? Because these both add up to to this single translation from A to C either way. That is, this one is tau dy y and dx x. This one is tau dx x and dy y. Now, this is ordinary vector additions. They are commutative. Obviously, you can change the order. Therefore, their uh, single shot equivalence being the same makes these two different or two different uh, transitions through two different paths equivalent. First x translation, then y translation, or first y translation, then x translation. Some of you may think this is a trivial statement. Well, as far as space translations are concerned, it is a trivial statement, and the sort of com the proofs written underneath is very convincing. But we see that this is very specific to the space translations. For example, it doesn't, uh, it's not obeyed by the space rotations. For instance, we'll see eventually that if we rotate about as an x-axis, then y-axis to reach to a different final configuration. And when you reverse the order, if you rotate about the y first and x next, you'll reach to another point. And these two x-y rotations are not commutative, but x-y translations here are commutative. And eventually, this will enable us to call, to, to define, to to say that these are abelian, abelian groups, abelian operations. Eventually, I will uh, stick to a I will reach to a particular relation to really say that this is really the definition of abelian nature of the translations. But let's see what do I what do I uh, what these mathematical equalities mean. Let's write it for the infinitesimal. Let me write the both left hand side and right hand side for the infinitesimal cases. What is the left hand side infinitesimal? Let me consider the infinitesimal case. And the left hand side is what? Left hand side is 1 minus i over h bar delta y, py, right? That's the y translation. And this one is the x translation minus i over h bar, delta x, px. Infinitesimal means you just retain the original, the linear terms only. Although I use the same notation for the capital N the, the delta for the infinitesimal and finite is, I know it's a bit cumbersome notation, but let's stick to it instead of using going to the d's. I could have done this. I could have used the d, dy's or something like that, but anyway, it's not that important. We know what we are talking about now, okay? In, in, in the infinitesimal case, actually, to be more rigorous, it should be replaced by that anyway, but the right-hand side is, 1 minus i over h bar delta x p 
Px times I identity, that is, I over H bar delta Y Py. These are the leading order terms. Then, however, uh, when I That's the right hand side. Okay, this one. That's the left hand side, that's the right hand side. Let me elaborate a little bit the left and right hand side separately. The leading term is the identity, and there are the cross terms, which is minus i over h bar delta y py plus delta x px that is the first order terms. If we stop at the first order term, this doesn't lead to anything new, obviously. We could do that. It's trivially, both sides are trivially equal to each other at this order if I stop. However, we have, let's go one step further. Although I know that I'm doing infinitesimal, doesn't matter. Minus minus is plus i is, i squared is minus one over h bar squared delta y, delta x, py, px. Okay, I'm sort of pushing the limits of the definition of infinitesimal translations. The product, at the, for the product of two infinitesimal uh, translations, I proceeded to the second order. I didn't stop at the first order, because that is where the difference will stop, start emerging. So that is the left-hand side, and what about the right-hand side? The leading terms is the one that's the same. The first-order terms are the same. Delta x, p, x, delta y, p, y. Okay. That's the first-order terms. And second-order terms, minus, minus is plus. I squared is minus. 1 over h bar squared. Delta x delta y, px, py. Compare the left-hand side and the right-hand sides. The first and second terms are the same, but the third terms are different. So if I now do the following, if I move this term to the left, and write it as a difference, what do I get? I get the following. Tau t, sorry, t, curly t, dy, y, t, dx, x, commutator, right? If you take it to the le left, first term, second term, minus second term, first term, is definitely the commutator of these two finite translation operators. So it means I move this to the left hand side and take the difference. The first term and second group of terms cancel. They are the same. And what we have is this term comes there as plus. So we have 1 over h bar squared delta x delta y px commutator with py. So these, the commutator of these Translation operators gives you a term which is second order in principle in terms of these tran infinitesimal translations, but also you need, you get the commutator of Px with Py. If they are the same, as is indicated by the underlying group property, then we should have that. I follow the book, therefore I don't, it's, I'm not very happy with this. We should have done it for the Ks before identifying with the Hs, perhaps. That is, keep it as K, because X with K, we have found a commutator, and then go through this argument and find the Kx, Ky commutator and set it equal to zero. This would be more reinforcing in identifying the generator of the translation, the k operator as p over h bar. That is, it satisfies that particular uh, commutator with the x, xi with 
K is I times delta IJ, and KI with KJ for any IJ, because it is valid for the X and Y, but for any IJ, KI with KJ is zero, then you say these, this is really should be a, the, identified as the momentum operator. To, repair, to match the dimensions, you divide it by, you multiply K by H bar, or you divide by the P by H bar to get the K. Anyway, this, if you want, is a derivation of the commutation of the momentum operators with themselves, okay, PX, P, with PY, and there is nothing specific about this XY uh, translate, combined translation. You could do it for XZ, and you could do it for Y and Z. You get the same results, and then we generalize that final commutation relation that we have found to PI with PJ. together with xi with pj, ih bar delta ij, and this was the starting point, which was more or less an implicit assumption that you need to specify at least three coordinates to have a state, even at the quantum level, that they should commute to have a common set of eigenstates for all the three components. Okay, so that is the so-called canonical commutation relations constructed in a, with the help of translation in the physical space. And that constitutes the basis of quantum theory, really. And for certain people, this is Quantum mechanics is a representation for this basic canonical algebra, and this is called the Heisenberg algebra also. This is quite well known. Well, uh, when you have these commutation relations, now you could go back to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that we have discussed last week. Particularly this one is interesting in that context. As you remember, if A and B are two non-compatible operators, that's non-commuting operators, then dA squared expectation value times dB squared expectation value is larger or equal than the well, 1 over AB commutator uh, squared. AB commutator expectation value mod squared divided by 4. It's a rather when you deal with the squares, that's as cumbersome as such. Therefore, let me write it. The xi squared d p j squared expectation value is h bar squared over 4. Of course, there is a delta ij in here. So it is x with px and y with py and z with pz, but x with py can be measured simultaneously. That is, once you measure the x1, the Cartesian x, so that you proceed and measure the y component of the p in that particular state, it retains the original information that it's an eigenstate of the x. py measurement doesn't spoil that, and you can, uh, but when you, if you first measure x and then px, then of course it spoils the previous information. It reduces or jumps to an eigenstate of the py operator. If you repeat the same measurement, and there is a certain probability that you can get that particular value of the x, there is no guarantee that it's going to be the same value in the first experiment. Also, it's a beautiful, uh, really, operator. Uh, algebra. This one implies that, and in a sense this one implies many of the quantum mechanical features that we are going to see. Here he comments upon uh, some of the uh, 
a basic commutator algebra things in relation with the Poisson bracket correspondence, A with A is zero, commutator of A with A is zero, etc. And it is anti-symmetric, A with B is minus the B with A, and the commutator of A with identity is zero, that's just the definition. And it is associative in the addition of the operator is A, A plus B with C is etc. So I don't want to get into that. You are you, probably you all know it quite well. And uh, well, I don't know. Perhaps I can write a few. Instead, I don't want to lose too much time, but. It, So simple, as compared to this classical physics, cl classical Poisson algebra, this is more or less trivial. So quantum mechanics is easier in the mathematical sense when you compare it with the corresponding classical one. A with A, because the commutator is the first factor times the second factor minus the second factor times the first factor, as simple as that. If so, this is trivial and that is trivial and that it commutes with any number, let's denote it C, when there is a number, it means there is an identity, so next to it, it is zero. And associativity is A plus B with C is A with C plus B with C. Again, just follows from the very definition that first factor times the second minus the vice versa. And the same is valid for the associativity of the second entry. A with B plus C would obey a similar distribution. Here, uh, perhaps this particular relation is, could be the most important one. Well, a little less trivial one, that is. Importance is the same for all of it. And well, this one is now, which is very handy in, uh, in the future discussion, which will be very handy particularly in relation with the Heisenberg picture manipulations, using the very, de very definition you can verify that is B with AC and A with B and C. First factor to the left, that's my thumb rule. First factor to the left and second factor to the right, you see. First factor to the left and second factor to the right, you get that result. And the same follows for the, f if I, for, for instance, if I have A, B with C, again, first factor to the left is B, C, and second factor to the right, A with C, B. A poor boy's version is just expand the right-hand side and show that it is the same as in two lines, sometimes in single line, same as that. And one further algebra, which we may not need at this class, is the so-called Jacobi identity. And if you have three operators, A, B, C, A, B, C, non-compatible, and you have the following whether it is the first position or the second. Let me use that the second position. A, B, C, this double commutator. Cyclically rotate the A, B, C. Cyclically rotate this manner. C, A, B, plus B, C, A. Again, such a trivial one, which could be demonstrated in two minutes by using the very definition of the commutator. But the corresponding one in classical Poisson bracket formalism is horrendous. Uh, perhaps some of you have seen it in, at your classical mechanics class. Perhaps some of you haven't seen it. It is really horrendous. So quantum mechanics is really simple and beautiful. And this is, this is the most, striking example of it. Now, we are going to move into the wave functions 
in position and momentum space. Wave functions is something that you usually learn at a more introductory quantum mechanics class. And the usual conventional form of the Schrodinger equation is written in terms of the wave function. So we would like to see how do we get, get to those wave functions because we'll have it in the position space and the momentum space and how they are defined. Okay. Now we have been considering state vectors, and in the book's notation we denote it as alpha. Say so alpha is an arbitrary state, right? Notice that we haven't introduced any label for this. Eventually we'll see that we have to introduce a label T, even at this level, if it is an abstract vector in a Hilbert space. For the continuous spectrum particularly, it's a Hilbert space because this space is infinite dimensional, and the basis vectors are the continuum vectors like position eigenvectors and momentum eigenvectors. And so there are infinitely many being continuum, so the space is infinite dimensional, etc. So there are position and momenta, which are referred as the basis vectors, but the, you may say, where is the time? Well, time is implicit in here. As we don't need it presently, or we haven't needed till now, we have suppressed that label. Eventually, we will revoke it. We'll bring it up because these states should have some dynamics, right? They should evolve in time. So yet they're buried in. Keep them buried in for the time being till we really need them explicitly. Time, I'm talking about time. But these are arbitrary states obeying certain rules. We define inner products and outer products and dual spaces and all that. But apart from that, we haven't said much in relation with the so-called concepts of wave function, which is uh, the older version of the quantum theory, right? Now, this is a more modern version. In the old time, when, it was, when the synthesis was finished, we had a function called psi of xt, and it's more my Fourier transform, phi of pt, etc. But psi of xt particularly is something which uh, is to be dealt with. So how do we really go to that uh, notation? Here, uh, actually, I will deviate from the book's notation, and I will call, because he goes to psi notation in a slightly more cumbersome context. Let's say the arbitrary state is labeled by the psi, whether there's a time dependence or not, of not, any con not a concern for me for the time being. How do I write this in terms of the position operator eigenvector basis. Let's go to the one dimension again. Let's work in the one dimensional case. One dimension. And we have the position operator and its eigenvalue equation is defined in the usual manner. Capital X is the operator, the others are the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And these are complete, meaning dx, x, and x is the identity operator. That's an infinite sum, right? It's being a continuous integral, an infinite sum. And uh, the, obviously, they are all operators. Each projects to that particular x position. This is an infinite axis, and there are infinitely many points in there, and each of them are peaked at, at each point. There are infinitely many points, even between a unit interval, right? So that's really difficult mathematically to picture it. So even imagining a Stengerla type of detect, uh, experimentation or detecting system is also difficult. 
when you say there, if there is a detector which would tick if the object is at the position x, but you know that there are infinitely many points in an if given in, in infinitesimal interval. So it's not going to be a single interval. You have to re, you have to refer to an infinitesimal interval of dx length. And so it's going to detect when it is in that infinitesimal interval, really. But anyway, mathematics part is easy. Now, when you really try to go to that physical interpretation, it is a bit cumbersome. And it's orthonormal. I'm referring to the basis, right? Orthonormal. In this sense, it's the direct delta. Direct delta is, a, a, again, also a very, uh, not a very comfortable, not an easy uh, entity uh, to comprehend. It's not a function in the ordinary sense. To, make it, to have a rigorous understanding, it's a distribution, and they are usually defined as representations through limiting procedures. The usual one is e to the e minus x squared divided by epsilon squared divided by epsilon, there's a factor of 1 over pi, square root of pi, that is really delta x. When epsilon goes to zero, the Gaussian becomes infinitely sharp, high, and infinitely narrow, for instance. So this is not a typical behavior of an ordinary function, right? Functions are uh, very innocent entities, but this is a distribution, but anyway, it is these things which enter in here. So what do we do? We can take this as a basis, being complete and orthonormal. Obviously, when I have this arbitrary state vector, I insert here an identity, multiply this with an identity. You can, of course, put psi and put a space so that it is an identity. What is that identity? It is this thing. dx, x, and x. So dx, x, and x and psi. Notice that these are coordinates in the, this basis system. We have talked about this previously in the discrete spectrum case. It is now the coordinates, this one. So what is, for instance, the probability of finding that system and you are measuring a position now? Now, whatever you, uh, observable you are focusing, so you are thinking of measuring it, then you use the particular basis vector system to expand it. If you are measuring, say, spin, I'm just joking a little bit, then you are not entitled to use the x vector basis uh, position, position vector eigenvector basis. Then you have to use the proper basis so that it will collapse into one of them. Obviously, if you are making a position measurement, then this is a, a, a legitimate basis to use. So what is the probability density of finding the system at, along this axis, say in a particular x position? If it is this x, for instance, instead of writing x0 or whatever, then it is x psi mod squared for that particular position. But actually, we have to really think of an interval of that sort and say that the actually finding the object in this interval, as there are infinitely many points, that's the point, that's the difficulty associated with the continuum system. So it is really the probability of finding it in this interval is interval times the xi squared, assuming that because of the continuum nature, this thing doesn't change much in that infinitesimal interval from point to point. In principle, there are infinitely many points in there. Dedekind, right? Dedekind tells us that there are infinitely many points between, even in an infinitesimal interval. So that if it doesn't change too much, by multiplying with the length of the interval, you are adding, right? The uh, probability here and here and here and here and here if they are the same, you just multiply with the length. 
you may say we don't really need that much sophisticated mathematical discussion. Of course, if you don't take it as a working principle, it's not that difficult to understand. So it is this quantity, really, which we define to be the psi of x in the conventional sense. Again, t is suppressed. t is there somewhere. We will pick it up. We will revoke it when we are, going, when we are discussing time development next week. So, if that is the identification, then you may wish to understand the psi 1 and psi 2, there being two arbitrary state vectors in the space of vectors, Hilbert space that's infinite dimensional, then how do you really convert it into wave functional language? Then you Insert here the completeness, identi completeness identity, that's an identity, so you, can, you are free to insert it here. Then what do you get? dx, psi1, x, x, psi2. Use the basic axiom of the inner product, convert into this one. And then it becomes, this is psi 2 of x, that's psi 1 star of x. And you get the usual expression, psi 1 star of x, psi 2 of x. Remember in the conventional, old, uh, more introductory level of quantum mechanics classes, you say the inner product of two wave functions psi 1 and psi 2 are integral of over x of psi 1 star and psi 2, right? That's, uh, we go back, we recover the old understanding. We may now uh, re go back to understanding or representing in terms of the wave functions the expectation value of an operator between two state vectors. Now I go back to my own notation, psi 1 and psi 2, more comfortable, instead of saying psi sub alpha. What is the alpha there? I don't know. That's what the book does. So when we have such an expression, A is an observable and psi 1, psi 2 are two arbitrary state vectors, so in order to understand this in terms of the wave function language, then what we do is we insert identities, okay? Completeness identities, dx, x here, dx prime, x prime and x prime and here to get a double integral dx and dx prime, psi 1 of psi 1 on x, x and a and x prime, x prime and psi 2. Well, this is the now by now familiar. This is the psi 2 of x, the wave function of associated with the state vector psi 2. And this one is convert and put a complex conjugation, psi 1 of x. So, x, this is x prime, sorry. So the double integral, dx, dx prime, psi 1 star of x. Now here is a matrix representation of the observable a in the position eigenvector basis, which is obviously a continuum matrix infinite by infinite continuum matrix because x and x prime are infinite dimensional themselves and psi 2 of x prime. Well this is again quite familiar, quite, uh, uh, but there's a difficulty here perhaps if you leave the A as an arbitrary observable without specifying it then there's a danger that it's bilocal, it may depend on these two points. Except 
X or X dependent, X operator or X operator dependent function operators, then life becomes simple. So if this one is, for instance, X, X operator or X squared operator or any function of X operator, then life is easy. If this is the case, then X a and x prime is x operator x prime, which is eigenvalue equation x prime, x and x prime, which is x prime and delta of x minus x prime. Nice. You see how simply it is reducing if it is x related things. Let me leave this for you as a private homework. Let me finish that statement because there's not much room left there. So this x a x prime becomes x prime delta x minus x prime. So then psi 1 of x and psi 2, because left hand side was a observable sandwich between psi, psi 1 and psi 2, it is this thing. Then dx psi 1 star of x, x, psi 2 of x. It is this, right? If it is x squared operator for this, it becomes x squared. If it is f of x operator arbitrary, this becomes f of x. So the integral becomes easy. If it is, psi 1 is the same as psi 2, the, if you are computing the expectation value, then psi f of x, uh, let me write this and I invite you to reflect on your own, dx f of x little x now, psi of x mod squared. It's something you know quite well, right now? All followed from the basic formalism that we have developed. An arbitrary state vector expanded in terms of the complete eigenvector basis of the position operator. Now we are, we have come to a more difficult issue and it's a very good point to give a break. It is the momentum operator now. Expectation values of momentum operator or momentum operator related operators in, the, in this context and that's what we will do next after the break.